Okay, we are live. We have Alexander Mercuris with us today. Alexander, how are you doing? I'm very, very pleased and extremely excited to have Tariq Cyril Amar with us today on the Duran. Just to say, um, I read pretty much everything that um, uh, any time I see that he's written something, I always read it. And um, I've learned an awful lot from Tariq. I must, I should just say that uh, before we proceed further with this program. Yes, and and everyone that has been watching the Duran over the over the years, they have been waiting for Tariq to join us. And we're very, very happy that you have you that we have you with us, Tariq. I have your website information in the description box down below. I will add as a pinned comment Tariq's Twitter and Substack as well. Um, we recommend uh, that everyone uh, follow Tariq and read all of the, the amazing analysis and information that he puts out there. Uh, Alexander follows Tariq, so we highly recommend Tariq. And before we get started to talk about some of the geopolitical realities in the world today, let me just say a quick hello to everyone that is watching us on Odyssey, on Rockfin, Rumble, YouTube, thedoran.locals.com, and a big thank you to our great moderators. Spartan Warrior Queen is with us. Peter is with us. Uh, Zarael, I think, is in the house as well. Thank you to our moderators and uh, Tariq, Alexander. A lot of news in the world today. Let's uh, let's talk about it. Indeed, and can I also say, if your position from London, which I am, an awful lot of anger today, uh, to a degree that I have rarely seen, huge amount of anger about the way things are turning out, not just in the war in Ukraine. I mean, that's the main part of it. But, I mean, a, a, a great sense that a lot of what was hoped for and anticipated out of this war is going wrong. A bitter article editorial in the Daily Telegraph this morning, for example, saying that Putin looks more entrenched than ever, which is one way of expressing it, but also a genuine sense that we've reached a pivot, a pivot point and that we're, we, in Britain, are on the wrong side of it, that, that things are now shifting um, away from us. Tariq, what do you think? Is that true? Are we at a pivot point? Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right about this. Um, let, let me add one thing before I answer your, your question, because I didn't have a chance to thank both of you for your very kind invitation and also your very kind introduction. Thank you very much. So um, I agree with you entirely. I think this is a a pivot point or maybe a, a turning point, a breaking point, but something, we are in a crisis, right? And the crisis has can go either way, uh, but it's unlikely that things can go on the way they have been going for much longer. And as to that, uh, that sense of anger that you are describing, particularly in Britain, um, I, I have a feeling this is quite widespread now in what I would call EU, NATO, Europe. And it's coming through, unfortunately, um, among the media class, right, which has been very streamlined throughout this war. Uh, it is also coming through um, in parts of the public, as one can sort of anecdotally tell, maybe from social media, which is perhaps even more unfortunate. Um, and it's coming through in the political elites uh, who have in a way, lost all self-possession, it seems, right? I mean, you have spoken about this particular response in Britain now, uh, but we've also had, I think, an editorial today by Charles Michel, uh, the head of the European Council. And, um, of course, on one side, on his Twitter, he attacks Putin's election, which is very ironic because nobody has ever elected him in any serious way for his position, which is extremely influential in its own way. But the other thing is he published an editorial, I think, yesterday, in which he literally says that the response to what is now happening in, in the war in Ukraine is that Europe has to adopt a war economy. He uses this term. He puts it in quotation marks, which is a very strange move, right? He wants to use this very strong word, but he doesn't quite yet have the courage to do it. So he uses it in quotation marks. But this is, as you know, aligned with much of what we've been hearing out of European elites in particular uh, recently. In fact, you know, there has been 
I've, I've just yesterday, I read an article published in Germany, of course, on Nachdenkseiten, which is sort of an alternative site, right? By uh, Michael von der Schulenburg and um, Hajo Funke. And both of these people are outside the mainstream, right? Von der Schulenburg has, has, has had a very distinguished diplomatic career with the UN, among other things. He's now with the Wagenknecht party that has emerged. But what they are saying, and I think they're right about this, is if you look at the United States, bad as things are, there are some signals of at least trying to rethink this a little bit, right? Whereas the European media and the European elites now have shifted into this, as I would say, these are not his terms, stay the course mode, right? And, and my sense is that what we are seeing is Remember when, when the Vietnam War wasn't going well for the United States in the last century, and there was this term, we've got to Vietnamize the war, we've, we've got to make it a Vietnamese affair. And it's almost we're seeing the Europeanization of this war, right? Not that the EU hasn't been heavily involved before, it should never have acted the way it acted. But now it seems the Americans are retreating piece by piece, and the Europeans or the EU Europeans, the EU NATO Europeans, I should say, are all too eager at this moment, it seems, I'm not saying it's going to stay this way, to take their place. That's at least the way they're talking. That's very interesting. Now, there's been a very interesting article in one of the sort of military journals here in Britain, um, the, published by the Royal United Services Institute, mm. by a man called Alex Vershinin, who's a very clever a talented military officer from the United States. And he's pointing out what a mil what a war economy really amounts to. And um, to achieve that, to achieve the kind of war fighting ca capability that someone like Charles Michel is talking about, you would need a social and economic revolution in Europe. You would need to transform European society and European institutions completely in ways that, in fact, would actually empower people in some ways <laughs> against the elites. So, I mean, you would have to, for example, provide skilled training for industrial workers. You'd have to have an awful lot more industrial workers. You'd probably have to have mm -hmm. them in unions. Vashinin doesn't talk about that, but it's difficult to imagine that that wouldn't happen. You'd have to have uh, sweeping industrial policies, all kinds of things, planning systems, things of that kind. And I don't know whether Michelle understands that, but it's you know, it's unachievable if you're going to try and preserve the current political structures and system in Europe. And I think that at some level, he probably does understand that. I think hmm. that collectively, they know that they can talk in this way, but that it can't be done. And I think that probably explains some of their anger and some of their um, you know, sense of frustration. But is there a chance that rather than try to do that long-term thing, they will try to do something risky and dangerous? We've had Macron talking recently about sending troops to Ukraine. Do you think that they might do a high stakes gamble of that kind. Uh, if, if I may say one word about your, your comments on the machine and article. Um, I, I, again, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I had read it, but I hadn't actually picked up on that aspect. I think you're absolutely right. It, it implies some form of political social revolutionizing of, of Europe first. And you know what, what that brings to mind to me now that you mention it? Uh, during the Second World War, I think, the Americans termed this, term, uh, termed this notion of the garrison state, right? They developed it first for what could happen if the Axis powers ever controlled Eurasia plus Africa, right? That, that, I think, was the origin of the term. And the idea was that we will be so beleaguered then that we have to turn our society into a garrison state, right? And then they used it in the Cold War with reference to what the Soviets were, could possibly do, but never, of course, had really were able to do to them. And, and I think what you're describing as this, as this implication of the Vashinian piece is that it's almost a dream about a garrison state EU, right? And you're absolutely right. It's not possible. It can't be done. As to your, to your question, do they think it's possible? I, I don't know. Uh, I think you're probably right that 
the smarter ones understand that it's highly improbable, right? I mean, even if you look at the recent European defense initiative or whatever they called it, this new plan that they set up, right? If you look at the details, the funding is totally underwhelming, right? And, and basically they're saying, yeah, but in the future we'll invest more. And you really have to ask yourself, where is it supposed to come from with Europe's economies in the state they're in? Now to your the question you asked at the end, which is, would somebody be insane enough to try, you know, um, what the Germans used to call an escape forward, right? So you're in a desperate situation and you counter your own despair by actually launching an attack, by going on the offensive, right? Um, I, I hope not. Um, I, I have watched some of your comments on, on Macron's initiative, and I, th I think if I understand you correctly, I agree with you that it didn't go very well for him, right? And that for now, at least, it seems that he has certainly not been able to bring major players in Europe behind him, right? And also, as you pointed out, Putin himself, the Russians have called his bluff in, in very strict terms, and I'm very happy they did that. I think that was very salutary for all of us, actually, for world peace. And it seems to have worked. But here is what what still um, um, makes me concerned about this. And that is the fact that he's not stopping. And when he started this whole thing, he did make one very interesting remark. I think it was at this initial um, press conference after this Paris meeting, where he launched this whole thing for the first time, I think. And one of the things he said was, well, we have seen many times that inside Europe, we have had red lines and then later these red lines were surpassed, right? And there, of course, he has a point, empirically speaking, has a point. Since February 2022, Europe as a whole, Germany is a prime example, but others have acted similarly, has moved from being very reticent about actually supplying into this war to being ever more reckless, so that we have reached the stage now where German officers, two of them generals, one the head of the Air Force, sit in a virtual room and discuss how they can camouflage German cruise missile attacks on Russian, on the Russians, right? So here I fear that unfortunately Macron's observation that the European scene, if I may put it that way, is so unstable and so badly controlled that maybe, maybe they can still get to cross a red line of that kind as well isn't entirely displaced. I mean, for the moment, I agree with you, it seems that that was something that failed. It was a trial balloon that failed. But is it entirely off the table? I, I, I fear not, you know, I wished it was. What do you think would be the reaction of the European public if something like that were tried? What do you think would be the reaction <clears throat> specifically in Germany, for example? I mean, the Germans have long history of war in this part of Europe. I mean, mm. you know, the, the Germans were there in the First World War. They were there yeah. in the Second World War. It didn't go very well. But that mm -hmm. was in terms of political time and in the lifetime mm. of people a long time ago now. Um, would people in Germany, would they support such a thing if it ever came to it or would there be on the contrary such a strong backlash that it would not be possible politically to do and might that lead to people if it would ever suggested questioning other things i unfortunately i think that the time that has passed since germans have for the last time fought horrific a horrific war in in this area has been so long that a lot of them have forgotten the lessons. That, that is my impression right now. Um, however, it's difficult to tell for a specific reason, which is that I also feel that the German media landscape, at least the traditional media, right, the major news magazines, the major TV shows, the major channels, um, also, um, yeah, that's basically, I think, what I was trying to mention, that these traditional media are right now extremely bellicist, astonishingly bellicist. You know, for a German of my generation, uh, I'm not that young. Uh, that's not the Germany I grew up in, uh, the West Germany, actually. I grew up in West Germany still. Mm -hmm. 
And that that was also a very conservative country in many ways, uh, deeply ingrained. Uh, but but there wasn't the the degree of um, fascination, open fascination again with weapon system that was just not fashionable. You just didn't do this. Constantly talk about, you know, what, what can our Leopard do to the Russians? Uh, what could our cruise missiles do to them? That, that wasn't done. I give you another example. The um, an extremely important um, officer in the Bundeswehr, in the in the German army, has just come out in a tweet. And he's tweeted that um, he is so happy because they're in the process of making the German army kriegstüchtig. Now, if you're not German, it's very hard to catch how strange this term is because what it literally translated means is war capable, capable of waging war, kriegstüchtig. I can guarantee you that in the 1980s, at the end of which I actually had a stint in the West German army, nobody would have used this term in West Germany. Mm -hmm. This would have been scandalous. Every time you talked about the possibility of war, even inside military training, which I went through, you talked about the case of defense, the Verteidigungsfall. You never said stuff like, Kriegstüchtig, we're going to war. You said, we may, we ha may have to defend ourselves. Now, on one side, that was a semantic game, right? Everybody knew that we were talking about the possibility of a war. But it is very striking that this type of rhetoric is now allowed again and that it's practiced by the army itself, that a very similar rhetoric is practiced by the Green Party, that similar people are unfortunately even in the SPD, not all of them, but a lot of them, in the government in general. So here's my, my short answer to your, to your initial question. I fear that some sort of reckless adventure where... Uh, NATO troops, EU troops would be posted in a part of, say, Western Ukraine, right, put on the ground, would initially not find much resistance. I'm not sure whether that means it means a lot of Germans would love it, but I don't think a lot of Germans would come out and actually act against it. The really interesting question to me is what is going to happen when the Russians will do what is entirely logical and attack these troops? Right? If you insert these troops into an ongoing war, put them on the battlefield, well, they become targets. And the Russians have told us that this old rule will hold. They will not make an exception. What will happen if Germans begin to hear that Germans have died in this way somewhere in Ukraine? Germans may already have died. I'm well aware of that, as I'm sure French mercenaries have died or even uh, um, foreign legion people have died in Ukraine and British troops have, I think, in de facto died in Ukraine. But you know we're talking about something else. An official big deployment by the current standards of official ground troops who are officially there being attacked, casualties. That's the first step. I don't know what would happen. But the next step, I think, is even more critical and interesting. What would happen if Russia would finally pull the plug on this fiction of not being at war with the West, while the war is constantly at war with, while the West is at war with Russia through Ukraine, and would attack a base in Germany or in Poland with Germans on it. I, I really don't know. Would Germans do what they did in World War I? Would they essentially, you know, circle the wagons, the famous idea of Burgfrieden, right? The peace of the castle, the beleaguered castle, and ultimately go along? Or would, what you have been hinting at, would they finally rebel? Personally, I very much hope they would rebel. But I also remember that a lot of socialists before 1914 hoped that mm -hmm. a lot of populations would rebel. And they didn't, right? Exactly, exactly. including a lot of socialists, of course, yeah. in Germany yeah. specifically. Yeah. Um, do you get the sense, which I also do, that amongst the elites there is now a fear of peace? in Europe specifically, perhaps to some extent also in the United hmm. States, but that yeah. they are very, very nervous about a peace settlement, which um, might in a kind of a way play against their position. Uh, we've had now statements. I mean, there was Zelensky, President Zelensky came to Turkey recently. He met with hmm. President Erdogan. Erdogan told him, you've got to talk to the Russians. Zelensky said no. Nobody in Europe is telling Zelensky, look, without the Americans, there's a limit to what we can do. It doesn't look as if the Americans are there for much longer. Um, 
that there's a kind of fear within not within the elites about not so much defeat but peace itself that a kind of strategy of maintaining tension is preferable even in the event of defeat to some kind of settlement which might lead to a secure peace because i have to say from the language of some people in europe within the elites i'm mm. almost getting that very sense actually mm. i i think you you are probably right um look i mean the the first thing that comes to my mind concerning this issue is uh in a paradoxical way um these elites of Europe who have become so belligerent, right, who have made war really their policy over the last at least two years now, um, there's one thing they, they have to fear from peace, which nobody else has to fear, which is that the peace will last. Because look at it this way. One story that we have been told again and again and again, and Michelle has said it again, Biden has said it recently, Scholz has said it, they all say the same thing, which is once Russia, if Russia ever wins in Ukraine, then Russia inevitably will attack us. This, this is the, one of the most important doctrines, mantras, that they're spreading without tiring of it. There is zero evidence for this. It makes absolutely no sense. It's, it's about as plausible as the idea that the Russians would have blown up Nord Stream. It's very similar in that there's just no motif. Why should they do this, right? But this fantasy has been extremely important for these European elites and for the way that they have treated their publics and electorates, right? Now, if the war ends, Let's assume Russia wins, which I think it will, and the war ends with some sort of settlement that is largely not favorable to Ukraine, at least not to the current regime. Let's be very precise here. That means that Ukraine becomes neutral, full stop, end of that silly discussion about NATO and all of that. Uh, and that is not favorable in, in indirect ways also to those governments inside the EU and the EU itself, the Commission, von der Leyen and so on, Borrell, right, who was a terrible warmonger, who has been a terrible warmonger throughout this, and sort of um, uh, discredits them. That's one thing. That's step one. But the second step would be the Russians would not attack. And that would discredit them as well, because they have told everybody that we have been fighting this long war. We have really accepted enormous damage to the politics and ec economies of the European Union. And we have, of course, sacrificed Ukraine in the process and hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians literally sacrificed to this by telling you, but if we don't do this, the Russians are coming for us and then they're not coming. And it's almost like this famous, I think, What is, what is going to happen to them is a little bit like that famous novel by an Italian author, I think it was called The Tartar Fortress. Yeah. where you sit forever in your fortress and you wait for the attack and it never, never, never comes, right? And that's the crisis. That is one thing. But the other thing, this is not the end of the problems they would face. They would then have to explain why the European economies have taken this enormous damage, why our energy prices are now much higher than in Russia and also in the United States, why we have accepted deindustrialization by our ally, the United States, why we have accepted the largest act of war and ecological terrorism, which the attack on Nord Stream, of course, was by our ally, the United States, and maybe with the Ukrainians in the mix. All of these things, once the dust settles, would be coming up for discussion again. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there would be questions about, okay, if we have peace now, and if it turns out that the Russians are not after all of us, why can't we reestablish normal relationships with them? Why can't we reestablish trade and interaction with them? Why can't we let go, not of just some sanctions, but actually all of them, because they serve no purpose, 
and they have been counterproductive even throughout the war. All of these things would come towards these European elites once there is a peace. And I think you're right. Of course, they're fearing that, right? There was a there was an old German, very, very sinister, dark saying at the end of World War II, and it went, enjoy the war. The peace is going to be terrible, mm -hmm. right? I think they're in this mindset by now. They're seeing something very unpleasant coming for them. And I think what your question really aims at is something else. They're disincentivized for peace. They're completely misincentivized now. They've done this to themselves, but still it's a fact. They've created incentives to go on instead of settling, which they should do, of course. Because the, the other thing that I sort of sense is that there are other powers in the world. This is the other great change that we have seen in our lifetimes, you and I, is that, well, when it was West Germany, it was all the binary system. It was mm. world politics was focused on, you know, the Northern Hemisphere, on North America and Russia and Europe. That was where the great duels were. But it isn't like that anymore. We have mm -hmm. the new powers that are rising. And I don't think it's widely known, but both China and India, and incidentally, since you're there, Turkey as well, I mean, they're actually, I think, trying to help the Europeans get out of this. Um, mm -hmm. Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, has recently been to Europe. He's been touring European capitals talking to European leaders, trying to get them to listen. Um, Jai Shankar, the Indian foreign minister, went mm -hmm. to the Munich Security Conference, where he made a very impressive and, I thought, intelligent contribution, saying, you know, you've got mm -hmm. to start basically mm -hmm. talking. Erdogan, mm -hmm. in his very complicated way, which I don't always mm -hmm. understand, but he basically was saying the same thing, and mm -hmm. this is what he said to Zelensky. But again, I get the sense that European elites particularly don't want to get this advice and mm. help from these non-European powers mm. because they still want to preserve the fiction that Europe remains the global epicenter of world affairs and that they don't want outsiders like the Chinese and the Indians and the Turks and others coming in and giving them advice and extending to them a helping hand. Again, am I right in thinking this, or am I seeing more to this than there is really there? I, I have a very hard time um, explaining the behavior of, you know, to be concrete, uh, Emmanuel Macron, Olaf Scholz, Annalena Baerbock would come yeah. to mind, Robert Habeck in, in Germany, the, the Minister of the Economy, um, what would be another good? Oh, of course, von der Leyen. I have a very hard time explaining their behavior in entirely rational agent terms, right? I mean, there's always this um, possibility, maybe it's a temptation to abstract from the psychology that these people also have. They have, you know, they have certain socializations, they have prejudices and so on. And to think that, well, because of their experience as politicians, because of their office and what their office demands of them, they must be deciding things at a much more rationalized level, right? Yeah. They, they must be relatively free of these emotional factors. And I have a very hard time doing this for them. Uh, you know, if, if because, not simply because they are being so bad actually at pursuing what should be European interest and the interests of their nations taken separately too, but because they are so ham-fisted about it and it's so easy to see and they are committing so many, well, I don't know a better word, embarrassing faux pas in the process, you know. I mean, Baerbock has given us very clear signs that she is not psychologically capable of understanding how incredibly powerful and important China is. She just doesn't get it. It's not in her head. Uh, Scholz, if you saw the, uh, the recent interaction with Anwar Ibrahim, Anwar Ibrahim is in Berlin and basically tells Scholz off to his face, right? And he was entirely right. This was about Gaza, as it happens. Yeah. But the other thing of that story is that how silly or how short-sighted, to use a more neutral term, uh, 
did a German chancellor have to be to walk into that? Why couldn't he think a little bit before he met this guy and think about his position and where he's coming from? No, mm -hmm. Scholz didn't do that at all. Ham-fisted again. So I, I tend to agree with what I think you're saying. I, I hope I'm right about this, which is there is a psychological factor. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with a persistent arrogance. I don't want to immediately use the term racism, but I do think there is an arrogance. And it has to do with who these, these elites see as common Europeans and who they see as, as not Europeans. Mm -hmm. Now, the irony, of course, is that the same European elites have abased themselves before the American elites as never before in post-war history. I really think this is true, even going back to World War II. This, this is the great paradox of our time. When the Cold War ended, the objective argument that you could make why Western Europe needed the Americans and had to pay a price in subservience you know, for their protection, it fell away. And we are now, how many, we, we are a, more than a third of a century later. But now, if European elites had we acted more normally to the end of the Cold War. We should be in a world where Europe and the United States might still be allies and have good relationships. That's a different issue. But mm -hmm. where this submission to American elites would have ended. We should be in that world because the objective reason for that is completely gone, right? And, of course, they would, they would argue it isn't. I understand. But there is something very, very odd about the way in which it's almost... It almost looks compensatory. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. There is a massive submission, a humiliating submission. I mean, think of the German chancellor standing next to Biden and smiling like an idiot when Biden is basically saying, yeah, we're going to blow up your pipeline. Right? I mean, it's humiliating. It's horribly yeah. humiliating. Yeah. And you begin to feel maybe there is a psychological compensation which goes along the lines of, yes, we have to sort of do this with the Americans, but at least we still feel bigger than everybody else. Yeah. And if that is really going on, mm -hmm. it's grotesque. It's, it's horrible. And of course, the rest of the world is seeing it by now. And the irony, the next irony is they are taking the Europeans even less seriously because mm -hmm. they're seeing it. Oh, I agree. I mean, just to say, I mean, it's not widely known but British-American relations during the Second World War were actually very difficult. There were moments during that alliance when there were bitter disagreements and arguments. Um, it's now been well established that the so-called friendship between Churchill and Roosevelt never existed. There were deep resentments between the two. But they still managed to work together and uh, uh, fight alongside because each made a hard-headed calculation mm -hmm. that they needed the other and they were allies that that was a relationship of not exactly equals but a relative equals and what we have in britain today is something else which is a psychology of dependence mm -hmm. and yeah. that has been long the case in britain but it seems to have spread to europe as well and this is particularly strange to someone like me, because I used to remember long ago, people were saying that the reason why we needed to build up Europe through the institutions of what eventually became the European mm. Union was precisely in order to achieve some degree of distance from yes. the Americans. And instead of that happening, what's happened is that those very same institutions have bound us to the Americans even yeah. more closely and yeah. have shut down the debate amongst yeah. us even further. Anyway, going back to your point about, you know, the fact that we go where the Americans lead, does that explain why Europe is unable to do anything at all that is positive about the situation in the Middle East, about Gaza specifically, which is, of course, right on Europe's doorstep. I mean, Europe is very, very involved in this conflict. Understanding why there is a state of Israel is, un is you, you need to go back into modern European mm. 
history to understand that as well. And of course, the Europeans have been heavily, intimately involved in the Middle East. The British and the French were the dominant powers there until the 1950s. Um, and um, besides which, um, the Middle East is very close to us. But it seems Europe, European states individually have no coherent policies about what to do about the Middle East. They seem to have the same paralysis and dependence on the Americans also. Uh, you know, um, the, the, uh, the thing, the, the, the case that, that has sort of attracted my, my eye in particular, and that has to do with where I grew up, obviously, is, is the German case, right? But if I, if I step away from that for a moment, what what also fascinates me, and somebody has commented on this recently and observed this, is the role of France, right? Um, uh, you added Britain to that, and both have a specific history in the Middle East. And with France, as somebody pointed out, and I really can't remember who it was, you can trace that until uh, a fairly late moment in the post-war period, France was seen as relatively critical of Israel, not not always, and unfortunately, I would say it was always also a major military partner for supplies and so on, as we know. But there was a very complicated situation there, and this is not recognizable anymore at all in, in French policy, right? So across the board, the, there are minor exceptions, right? Ireland is, is trying to strike a slightly different tone. Uh, Borrell uh, has gotten cold feet, I would say, recently, you know, and, and is at least saying things about Gaza, that the genocide in Gaza, that's how I see it. I should be very clear about this. That's my position on this. He's saying things that, for instance, von der Leyen would never say, right? And people have speculated about that, what that means. But I think you're still, you're still absolutely correct. The overall picture is that Europe is marching in lockstep with the United States, and the United States has done in with regard what the United States did after the Hamas attack on October the 7th, right, was a classical horrific error of foreign policy. It's worse than an error, but I'm using this term now. Um, they, they handed out a blank check, right? They, they did what you should almost never do. They said to a much weaker state, do whatever you want. We don't care. We are with you. Right. And we all know that if the Germans hadn't done that to the Austrians, we would perhaps not have gotten into World War One. Blank checks are a really bad idea. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we can talk about why this happens in the United States, why the United States sticks to this policy uh, after six months of slaughter by now. Right. But um, to return to your question, why do the Europeans not offer any sort of alternatives? Why do they not at least impede? the Israeli attacks. Why, to be concrete, uh, has the German government multiplied, I think, tenfold arms supplies to Israel actually during this genocide, right? There's a very concrete policy that is driven by the Federal Security Council, the Bundessicherheitsrat, which is why some people in Germany are now trying to sue them, actually. It won't work because the judicial system isn't unbiased enough. Um, I really don't know the answer. I don't think it is simply about a sense of guilt, as some people, you know, guess that somehow these Europeans, especially the Germans, of course, for obvious reasons, feel so guilty about what they did to Jews in the Holocaust during World War II, the genocide that they committed there, that they're completely paralyzed and they cannot in any way impede Israel, whatever Israel does. I think this isn't true, actually. I think it's a mix of factors and they also have to do with, A, again, subservience to uh, American strategy and seeing no alternative to that. They may have to do with economic considerations, right? This has come up recently. They may have to do with ideas about economic corridors, uh, terrible as this, this would be. Um, and also, I think what is in the way yet of the Europeans ever changing their behavior on this is a credible challenge in the Middle East. If the Europeans were looking at a coalition of powerful Middle Eastern states able to actually challenge Israel, of course, there is the Iranian axis or Iranian led axis of resistance, there's Yemen and so on. 
But this is not yet ultimately a very powerful challenge. Right? It's not a game changer, as you say mm. now. I think if the Europeans were confronted with such a situation, mm. they might behave mm. differently. And I'm saying this because one of the things that I think will come out of this genocide is Iran acquiring nuclear weapons after all. Mm. And once that happens, things will change in the Middle East. And mm. then we would see what the Europeans will do with that, actually. Mm. Can I just uh, turn quickly to the Americans? Because I think that the Americans do actually retain a degree of agency. We've discussed hmm. how you can actually get debates in the United States. And that's very striking. You see the American media, you find on its margins, but they're important margins, that real discussions about strategy based on not always on realistic assumptions, but more realistic assumptions mm. than those in Europe do take place. And of course, the United States has the confidence that whatever happens, it is going to remain a great power. So it, it can, it can, it does have made much more space and ability to maneuver than the mm. Europeans do. That might in time, and this is a completely separate question from what Donald Trump might or might not do, mm -hmm. but it might lead to the Americans making decisions which the Europeans might not like and which the Europeans who are in a very dependent position might not be able to challenge. Um, Putin fairly recently said that he believes that some kind of a dialogue with the United States will resume at some point. Mm -hmm but that he doesn't expect that to happen with Europe. And that, it seems to me, for the Europeans would be a catastrophe. Uh, I was not aware of that statement, Pam. That's yeah. extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. he's he's probably right about that. Um, I, I have to say that a similar thought, not, not the same, but a similar thought did occur mm -hmm. to me a few days ago, where I was thinking, look, um, in, in the Cold War, there were moments of detente, right? And in that detente, the Europeans did play a role, right? The famous Ostpolitik of Brandt and so on. Uh, but it would be possible to imagine that at some point, the a different type of American leadership and the Russian leadership will actually find a common language again. Not necessarily agree on everything, no, of course not, but that they will re-enter a space in which they can actually make agreements with each other about contentious questions, right? which I think really due to the Americans, that space has collapsed. This is not the Russians' fault. Uh, you, can, you can blame the Russians for all sorts of things. I've done so on occasion in public, but you cannot blame them for collapsing the space for diplomacy. And you can be very, very concrete about this before Russia actually attacked Ukraine in a major way. I know some people don't like the term large-scale invasion, but we know what we, what we mean, right? February 2022. Yeah. It was the Russians who two, three months before that, at the end of 21, made a very, very clear high-level diplomatic initiative in these two draft treaties that they presented to the West and said, let's talk before it's too late. And I think the signals were absolutely clear, right? They, they really did not give us no warning. And you could you could heap the you could heap up evidence on the thesis that the, the destruction of diplomacy is really a Western thing. This is not what the Russians have done. This is not important because I want to shift the blame or distribute the blame. It's important because it really only takes a change on the side of the Americans now. The Russians, of course, have lost trust massively, but Samuel Cherub and, and Jeremy Shapiro made one good point in a recent article, which is yeah, but every such crisis, conflict, war comes with massive loss of trust. And somehow people talk to each other again after a while. They somehow do. You, you need to rebuild the trust, right? So like you, I think it's entirely possible that at some point, not only will Ukraine be left in the middle, right? Maybe the Europeans will be left in the middle. And these two major players will start talking to each other in a way that neither of them, neither Ukraine nor the Europeans will have much influence on. If Trump becomes president, which I think if nothing very strange happens, <laughs> is likely now, then that process might be sped up. It does play a role, I think, in that respect. Um, 
But there is a longer term trend, which I agree with you that the Americans have the great advantage over the Europeans that um, they are a great power. They, they, I think they're declining, but they, they still have a lot of power militarily, economically, and so on. They're sitting on it. And they also, space matters, you know, location, location, location. And the Europeans, of course, and they should have thought about this, are in a horrible location to be in a bad relationship with Russia, right? Mm -hmm. The Americans are in a very different location in that respect. This is the age-old advantage on this globe. Now, um, if an American elite should at some point be wise enough to actually address the problem of decline productively, Instead of saying, we push back, we push back, let's fight, let's fight, let's fight the multipolar world, which is another way for mm. saying the United States declining, right? The multipolar world emerges as the United States declines. Mm. If they should ever become constructive and instead ask, okay, our moment of preponderant power is over, or, well, it happens, how do we secure a good place among the great powers in the concert of powers of the new multipolar world. This would be a rational American response. I'm waiting for it, right? If they should ever do that, then once again, even that would get them to finally talking differently to Russia, ideally talking differently to China, which is yet another question, right? And in both scenarios, I don't think the Europeans would have much to say. I, I think you're absolutely right. Can I just say both Putin and Xi Jinping have addressed the Americans and have said exactly that thing in their mm. last summit meeting, Xi Jinping, when he met uh, uh, Biden in San Francisco, he actually said, you know, we're, we're not looking to supersede you. We're not mm. looking to establish a hegemony in place of your own. We want to work with you. And mm. Interestingly enough, and this was said some months ago, actually, Putin made a speech in which he said, look, there's lots of things the West does which we don't understand. We don't understand their social issues. But, you know, at the end of the day, if the Americans want to come to terms with us, they have a place in a new multipolar system as yeah. well. We are not seeking to exclude them. He was specifically talking about the Americans again. This is a separate comment from the one that I've discussed mm. previously. But he also said, we're not looking to exclude them. We are interested in creating a concert of powers based on the United Nations system, ultimately. And the Americans, if they want, they have a place in it. But what we will not accept and we will not tolerate is the kind of unipolar hegemonic system that the United States is trying to perpetuate. And by the way, in a program that we did on the Duran, the Indian, uh, there was an Indian ambassador who told us exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. He also said that, you know, India had hoped that the United States would um, agree to a peaceful transition to the multipolar system, and that the Indians have been very disappointed that, on the contrary, the Americans up to this point have resisted it. So one can see that there is a a way back for the United States with all of these powers. But of course, the Europeans risk, instead of becoming partners in this, mm -hmm. becoming objects as the decisions about them are made yes. by others. And that, I think, is something that people in Europe perhaps sense, leaders in Europe perhaps sense, but don't really yet have a plan or, or real idea about what to do. If 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 European governments and if um, the the structures of the EU, right, this this Commission that that is trying to be what von der Leyen threatened us with years ago, the geopolitical Commission, right, we've seen where that has led. Um, if if they were reasonable, um, they could even be relatively cynical about it, right? Um, then they would long have understood that the chance for leverage for Europe is, I don't want to put it too crudely, but 
that there is an element of playing both sides or all sides yeah. actually, right? Mm -hmm. in, in, you could almost say that in a multipolar system, by definition, your leverage is the ability to play all other sides, right? That's what you do. And what the Europeans have done instead is they have sort of um, grabbed, right? the Americans by the ankles and they're holding on tight to them and they're paying with the potential for actually executing a foreign policy, whether it's several foreign policies or a more or less united foreign policy, the eternal problem with Europe, of course, for executing some sort of European foreign policy that would actually pursue European interests, right? Um, they have, I think you could put this another way. When the Ukraine war, um, when we had the build up to the war between 2014 and 2022, yes, there was a war, but it was much smaller and so on. And we had the build up to the larger war, right? And then 22 and everything that happened afterwards, I almost see the Europeans as insane gamblers. They, they, they took a high risk path they basically put all their eggs in one basket. And the basket was, the Russians are weak. We just know this. We just guess this. And we are right about this. The Americans are very, very strong. We side with the stronger side. And we will be on the side of the winners. Right? Mm -hmm. It would have been much less risky, even if nobody knows the future, to say, we don't know who is weak and who is strong. We don't know this. War is a test. You only find out by war. So maybe a smart way of maneuvering would be to actually delay the Americans, dampen their drive to war down, talk to the Russians, ask for something in return from them. Um, Europeans, I can be concrete about this. It would have taken one major NATO member in Europe, like for instance, Germany or France, to say, we will never agree to membership for Ukraine. Right? That would have changed the situation. The Russians would have had to believe it. That's a problem, I know, going forward. Um, there would have still been the problem of the fact that other NATO members, above all the United States, were trying to put Ukraine into NATO unofficially, which, of course, the Russians had picked up on and talked about already before the large-scale escalation of the war. This, this wouldn't have been a magic wand. But it would have been a sign of the Europeans at least trying to carve out a space for themselves. And the beauty about such an approach would have been that all these people in the Green Party, in the SPD, in the German media, I'm now focusing on Germany again because I'm so angry with them, frankly, would have saved a lot of Ukrainians as well. And they would have saved Ukraine from this horrific war. Or you could go further back. What would it, would it have cost uh, Hollande and Merkel to not help the Ukrainians sabotage Minsk II. Yeah. Sab Minsk II was a short document, but it had the UN behind it. As we all know, it was the best way out of this crisis. And it was feasible if the Europeans had said to the Ukrainians, you want to cheat on this, not with us. We yeah. will withdraw all support from you. They had some leverage there. They did the opposite again. Now, ultimately, I don't have an explanation why Europe is behaving so irrationally, right? So much and not in its own interests. But one thing that does occur to me more and more is that parts of our elites, I think, are heavily subverted by the United States. Yeah. I'm beginning to see them as comprador elites that are basically not even interested in pursuing European interests. They're interested in something else. I have to say I agree. Now, on that point, and that very, very powerful and wise point, by the way, uh, uh, Tarek, I'm going to transfer to, to Alex at this point because I know we've got lots of questions. We could talk, I can tell, for hours, uh, you and I, about these matters, but um, I'm sure there'll be people who have questions to put to you, and I really should pass over to Alex at this point. <laughs> Yeah, let's take a, a couple of questions and uh, whatever um, questions are left, Alexander, we can uh, we can answer them. So let's uh, go to Rebel King. Do you guys think Putin can liberate us from our Western dictators, liberate us from our Western dictators so we can also join Russia? Interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> Here's, look, should I answer? Should I 
try to yeah yeah it. these are, oh, these okay. are for you oh, yes. okay these are for i get you. it i get it sorry yeah. um look um i i think my first answer to that is he's not interested <laughs> that's not what he's after <laughs> putin is um I, i have great differences with his approach to politics I, for one thing, because I'm a socialist, I, I can be open about this of some sort. And I, Putin is not a socialist. He's not after rebuilding some form of socialist commonwealth, as some people think. But I, I, I have never seen a problem with the fact that he puts Russia first, because that's his job, actually, right? He's the leader of Russia. And it's a very natural and very normal thing for him to do it's actually a very responsible thing for him to do um so he's i don't think he will try to solve our problems with our elites in any way but uh, let me be let me add one thing um i think it is possible that the fact that our elites will be heavily discredited by this unnecessary fight against Russia that I do think they're about to lose, that might have ripple on effects that may, may perhaps shake up the European political scene. And I, I have to add one other thing, I'm sorry, but I, I'm also by nature a bit of a pessimist. So when I say up, shake up the scene, I am not predicting outcomes, but that there could be major changes coming from the European Union, in essence, losing its proxy war. That I think is quite possible, yeah. The hockey goalie asks, can EU leaders not see their militaries can't cash the checks they're writing with all these escalatory remarks? Rational people no. can see the emperor has no clothes. Yeah. I, I, I don't know why they don't see this. I, I sometimes... You know, um, if <laughs> Alexander will remember this, Alex, you maybe too. Um, there used to be a German chancellor who was not as bad as the current one, actually, Helmut Kohl, right? You could have your issues with him, but he wasn't like Scholz. And Kohl famously uh, didn't understand economics. Right? In this respect, he was very similar to Gorbachev, actually. <laughs> um, and I begin to feel there are some people around in Europe who do not want to understand military matters, although they want to make decisions about them. And they treat armies and military means of, you know, getting your will in, ex in extreme cases, like miracle weapons. They, they, they strike me a little bit like children who believe these mythic tales. You know, we have the best rocket. We have the greatest tanks. And, and I know you have mentioned him often, and I watch him regularly. They need to watch Brian Balletic much more often, or they need to read Vashinin, right? To come back to the, to the, by the way, excellent piece you mentioned at the beginning, Alexander, Vashinin's piece is great, because there are many things that are not in there, but one thing he does beautifully, he really shows you in detail how hard it is to become good at attrition warfare. Yeah, and that implies how very far away these guys are from that. And he also advances the argument that he doesn't use this term, but I read him as saying this is why in the West we have developed a habit of believing in quick fixes because we can only do quick fixes. Yeah. And the dirty secret behind that is we can't even do the quick fixes anymore. Yeah, it's true enough. Yeah, very true. Elaine asks, can our arrogant and dangerous leaders not see the evident truths that the Duran and Tariq have always seen. So what is their end game? Look, uh, that's, that's very uh, flattering. Thank you very much. Obviously, we don't know, right, in the end. But uh, um, if you ask why, why can they not even see, let's, let's put it more neutrally, the risks, right, that, that people like us are talking about. And I would argue the risks are obvious enough, and, and it's their job to see them, right? Why can't they do it? Um, I don't know the answer, <laughs> frankly. I One answer I think is, I, I do think that, and I, I don't know when this happened, but the memory of major warfare in Europe has apparently um, become weak to such an extent that I see this in the German case, and I do think I see it a little bit in the Scandinavian cases and 
I feel I see it a little bit in the French case, although Macron got a lot of backlash as well, luckily, right, from his own public, that I think a lot of people don't understand what a major land war in Europe would be like. I think they have these very sanitized ideas. Um, here, I make a pop culture reference. There was a Norwegian series a while ago and it was called Occupied. And it all turned on this fictitious scenario in which the Russians occupy Norway. Uh, intrigues this, intrigues that. But what was interesting about it is there wasn't any real fighting. It was all about war, but the war was very, very small scale. You know, there were these minor, minor engagements between a few Marines on a little island, and then somebody shot down one fighter plane. That was sort of the scale of the war. War had been reduced to these pinprick operations in this fantasy. And I'm beginning to, to fear that there are people in Europe that simply don't want to understand that war would not look like that. Not once major European states are openly engaged against the Russian Federation. That would be a large war, a very large one. And even the war in Ukraine, which after all they can observe, should already have taught them that, that this type of modern war is going to be very destructive. And why they can't see it, why they don't want to really face it. You know, the Russians have, there is a part of Russian nuclear doctrine. And it, it reads very, very frightening. And it literally runs, there may be a necessity in, in a large scale conflict, not Ukraine, in a much bigger conflict, where much more is again at stake. There may be a necessity to carry out what the Russians call a sobering strike. And by that they mean a relatively, relatively early use of a nuclear weapon just to get some people in the right place in their head again in the West and show them what can happen. Now, obviously, I'm not for the use of nuclear weapons. It's a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. But this idea of sobering, it struck me when I read that because I thought they were up to something there. We, are, we have become very unsober about war in Europe, it seems. Yeah. You have time for a couple of more, uh, Tariq? Uh, I, I do, yes, of course. Yeah, okay, great, great. Uh, the hockey goalie asks, could Ukraine be seen as a Thucydides trap for the US? Losing in Ukraine could be akin to Suez, unipolar versus multipolar world. I'm, I'm trying to, I, yeah, I'm, well, it's a, that's a complicated question. Um, mm. So the Thucydides trap, um, you know, the original, it goes back to the Peloponnesian War, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and and the, the Athenian general who wrote about it. Like, and, and so the Thucydides trap, the, the basic idea, I hope I'm summarizing this correctly, is that two powers, that's the original version, can simply not trust each other. And because they cannot trust each other, the question really of perception, right? Ultimately, they end up in a conflict. Um, I don't think this is what happened in Ukraine, to be, to be honest. I think in Ukraine, and again, I'm not saying this out of sympathy for one side, but I think that the historical record will be that in the case of the Ukrainian conflict, Russia was advancing an agenda that its Western opponents did not like. Okay, that's one thing. But Russia was not intransparent. Russia was very transparent. And so I don't think it was ultimately really a perception problem. Uh, it was a problem of rigidity. The West just didn't want to give an inch, right? This was very pronounced in the run-up to the war when um, people like Jens Stoltenberg, the figurehead of NATO, that's what he really is, right, kept saying that... Um, uh, it's simply against the rules of NATO that we ever close our door. And if you read the NATO treaty, that is utter nonsense. There is no such rule in NATO. There is no rule based on the treaty that says mm. everybody must be accepted in the end. Yes, there are rules for acceptance, right? Mm. But there also is a very clear rule that a state can only be accepted with complete unanimous consent of all current members. Mm -hmm. And this was constantly obfuscated by the West and NATO itself, right? That was the degree of 
of stubbornness, of obstinacy on the side of the West here. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was a Eucydides trap. I think it was much more a case of arrogance and overreach. Yeah. It was a case of overreach, really. Can, can I just say something about this? Because I, I, I constantly hear about this Thucydides trap. As somebody who has read Thucydides extensively, and of course he is part of my history because I'm Greek, um, I can say for a fact that Thucydides never believed in any such thing as a Thucydides <laughs> trap. What, what, where it all derives from is one sentence taken out of context mm -hmm. when he discusses the origins of the war between Spa Arthur and Sp mm -hmm. Athens and Sparta. And he says that the underlying cause of the war was the growth of Athenian power yeah. and the fear this yeah. caused in Sparta. Mm -hmm. He never says, though, that there was no alternative to that war. Yes, he makes yes. it quite clear that yeah. both Sparta and Athens had alternatives. And yeah. in fact, he is very critical of the wrong political decisions that were made in both states, especially in Athens, which led <laughs> up to that war. So, you know, yeah. I, I think that people are imposing a determinism yeah. and mm. denying a capacity for decision which Thucydides mm. never never suggested now i just want yeah. to say that i mean it's not perhaps at yeah. this discussion no absolutely there I, is always very choice <laughs> <laughs> no I, I think you're absolutely right i um, th th yeah can i add i mean two things that have always struck me about it which is I, I also read the Peloponnesian War as, as, as almost a very ironic story. It is a bitter ironic story because if you think about it, the Spartans and the Athenians had defeated the Persians one or two generations before. And at the very end of the Peloponnesian War, the Persians actually come back and help reestablish peace. It, it's a horrible tale. And, and, you know, the other thing that now that you mentioned, mentioned the way that he treats Athenian politics, right? Um, the Sicilian expedition also comes to mind, right? A crazy overreach, right? Maybe that is like the analogy we could sort of think. In. But the other thing that also strikes me, I'm sorry, I have to add this now. No, you really make me think about it. But it, what, what always fascinated me about him is that uh, he's actually very fair to the Spartans. That, that to me is one of the, the most interesting and modern aspects of the book. He's an Athenian general. Of course, his career in essence was checkered and complicated, but he goes out of his way, I would say. Some people have, have contested this, but I think he's very um, interested in understanding at least what the Spartans want and where they are coming from. And that again is something that's been completely missing from the West, right? Yeah. The West just demonizes now. It does never ask, okay, we the West and they, Russia, or they, China, want different things. But at least we concede to them that they too are rational. They too have a logic. We clash, but we both have logics. Because once you accept that, and, and that goes back to your point about Thucydides, once you accept that point, once you stop demonizing and concede a certain logic to the other, you can negotiate, right? Whereas on the other hand, if you only demonize, you can't negotiate. And I think that's the purpose of demonization. This is why ultimately there has been this whole idiotic cottage industry of comparing Putin to Hitler. Because mm -hmm. the message be behind that is that on the Nazis, we all agree, as I would say, for good reasons, that no, you couldn't negotiate with them. You just had to fight them to total defeat. So every time the West nowadays wants to be uncompromising, it tries to impose the Nazi image on its rival opponent or potential partner. And the fact is that historically the Nazis were very exceptional. Usually opponents are not like this. It is much more common that you can actually still talk to your opponents. Uh, Brad Arnold says, what are the odds Russia will cross the Dnieper? I, you know, to, to be very honest, I'm not trying to evade this, but given uh, Alexander's intense um, and, and very regular, really constant um, um, observing of what is actually happening on the ground, which I listen to, but it's not the same as actually doing this, 
I do almost think that this is a question for Alexander, to be honest. <laughs> it, oh, it's yeah, a question that you probably answered uh, many times in the past as well, Alexander, uh, but um, uh, uh, the, what are the, the chances? Short, the short answer is absolutely nobody knows, apart from people in the Kremlin and the Russian mm. general staff. We can look at what they are thinking and doing. I think to some extent, actually, it depends on the political development. If there is a mm. negotiation. If there are proposals, there might be very hard terms. In fact, there would be mm. extremely hard terms now. But I don't think the Russians want to cross deep into Western Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, they might feel they have no choice but to do that because a political mm. settlement is yeah. impossible. But I think that they would still prefer a political settlement if they thought that would be secure and stable that mm. they could rely on it. And that is very, very hard question, even for them to answer. Putin himself, in his interview recently with Kiselyov, the Russian uh, journalist, basically was saying it's going to be very difficult to come to an yeah. agreement. But he didn't yeah. shut the door. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I had exactly the same impression of, I think I know the, the moment in the interview you have in mind, but he says something like, Yes, we are open to talks, as we've always been, but not on the basis, he uses a very, very um, brutal term, but but essentially he says of wishful thinking, you know, and says something like of people who've spoke too much, or, you know. Um, so we only, we are open to talks on the basis of realities on the ground. And I think you're right that that by now means that what Ukraine could have had in 2022 in March, April, right, the Istanbul talks really, mm -hmm. that were torpedoed by the West, that's all gone. That's gone. That's not coming back. Yeah, agreed. Let, let's do two more, and then we will uh, let you go, uh, Tariq. Um, Alexander says, why don't the Muslims, Muslim states stop selling oil to the West like what they did during the Yom Kippur War in 1973? I think this is, a, I think we're in a different economic situation. I think, first of all, the um, Muslims, the Arab states, the oil producers, stopping sales of oil in that kind of way, it would be very difficult for them. It would be much more difficult for them to uh, get by with that than it was in 1973. Um, Saudi Arabia is already running a budget deficit. They have a very expensive uh, um, economic program. They don't want to jeopardize that. And at the same time, I think that they don't want to get into an outright collision with the United States. What they want to do is to pursue a policy of diplomatic pressure. And I think that is probably actually in the long term, the correct strategy. That is my thought. Now, I'll be very interested to hear what Tariq has to say. I, 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 I would add only two things. I, I agree. Yeah. I'd add two things. One is um, I wished that um, Arab Muslim states uh, or majority Arab and Muslim states would um, uh, strike Israel much harder than they do. I, um, including militarily, by the way, I, I think a genocide justifies that. But, but I also know that they probably, they, I'm sure they can't do this yet. And one reason that that isn't possible is that Israel still sits on its solitary, entirely illegal nuclear arsenal in this region, right? So before um, before there could be a, a coalition attack of Middle Eastern states against Israel in the future, one of them would have had have to nu have nukes and for the simple reason not to use them, but to neutralize the Israeli arsenal. That's a very you know different point. I understand. Now back to the oil. I think I would add one point, which is that America is also very different. And I think that the main target of such an operation would have to be America. Europe would suffer, but Europe doesn't decide anything. So it's not important, right? You would have to get at America. Yeah. And America is no longer that dependent, partly because of the fracking revolution, right? America actually is not in the same situation as in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. All right. And from, uh, from Sparky. When I was in West Germany in the early 1980s, Germans would never abide German leaders being such obvious fools as they are now for even one second. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what happened. Uh, look, um, I don't want to make the mistake of, of 
being nostalgic, right? Nostalgic bias, where you always think things weren't quite as bad as as they now are when you were younger. Okay, but nevertheless, having said that, I've really been thinking about, in particular, Scholz and his government. And I do feel it's very hard for me to find a German post-war chancellor worse than Scholz. Uh, and, and to put this even more precisely, I think he's actually the worst. I don't think there's an equalizer. I, I go through them, even relative duds, to be a little rude, like Kiesinger, right, or Erhard, they don't qualify. And if you hold them up against people like Adenauer, Brandt, the party doesn't matter, Schmidt, you know, uh, who was from the SPD like Scholz, Scholz is abysmally bad as a leader. That That is actually true. Mm. Now, the question was slightly different. Why is there, as it seems, so little pushback? Um, I think one thing that has, has changed is the media landscape, really. And the example I would give you is if you look at Spiegel, Der mm. Spiegel. Der Spiegel used to be by far, hands down, the best German news magazine for the post-war period, right? And it was generically on the left, liberal left. Um, it used to get into scrapes with the government all the time. And if the Spiegel was, as it was 30 years ago, this I can actually say, the Spiegel would constantly issue articles criticizing and at least heavily questioning the line on Ukraine. But the opposite is the case, exactly the opposite. So the media landscape in Germany has changed. I find it uh, much more homogeneous than I would remember it from when I was a teenager in the 1980s. That, that degree of almost self-coordination, I'm afraid, I don't really remember. And where this has come from, again, I really can't tell but i find one thing interesting that in some way this this uh, this turn towards um a more chauvinistic style let's say in german politics and in parts of the public and in the media has coincided with a turn against russia and that that historically is very interesting right i mean if you know german history russia can bring out the worst in germans um, and that's not Russia's fault. There's something very strange about the way Germans project on Russia. And occasionally that takes the form of romanticization. That also happens, where they're too optimistic, where they're a bit naive about how Russia works and what Russia is. That's, a, you know, it happens. But we are now going through a phase of demonization of Russia. And somehow this, I think, is a major catalyst in this terrible hardening of the German media and public debate space, or this narrowing of the media and public debate space. But I don't have a complete answer, right? These are just some thoughts. I'll Let just quickly, yeah, yeah. quickly to say the Guardian, the Guardian is exactly the same yeah. as Britain. Yes. The newspaper that I remember is completely different. And mm. again, the demonization of Russia has undoubtedly led to a hardening of the media and political space. And again, I don't have a full or complete answer mm. to what has happened here in Brussels. Mm -hmm. let, let me give you one more question, Tariq, from Elena. And, uh, and then I promise we will let you go. What if, Russia oh. isn't interest, what if Russia isn't interested in friendship with Europe, but just mm -hmm. offers cold capitalism? Europeans have not been reliable friends. You know, to be honest, if if I if I try to imagine Russia's perspective, right, as good as I can, I wouldn't be interested in friendship. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, not just because I'd be. Uh, you know, the Russians have taken heavy losses here too, right? They they're not as heavy as as many Westerners claim. But this has been a bloody war for Russia as well, and it wasn't necessary. And from Russia's perspective, it could have been avoided if only the Europeans had played a different role. And I think Russia is right. So they, they're not going to be happy with the Europeans for a while. Um, but I do think my impression, you know, this, this holds for um, Rebkov, uh, Putin himself, um, Lavrov, you know, when you look at, at Russian leadership figures, also Russian think tankers or their equivalents, right? I don't see the obstinacy and the bitterness I see on the European and Western side. I see, nevertheless, I see a hard-headedness, which is pronounced by now, and which is like, we don't do anything on trust with you guys. You know, that's over. Mm -hmm. But I do see 
enough of rationality that I think would enable the Europeans to build up what Elena, I think, referred to, cold capitalism relationships with Russia, mm. right? Insofar as those will be advantageous to Russia as well, right? I don't think Russia will do anything for Europe just to please Europe. And why should they? I mean, this is, that, that makes absolutely no sense. Among other things, not again, not out of anger, but mm. out of strategic calculation. Europe has just shown that it is entirely capable of participating in a type of proxy war against Russia that at its core aimed at A, regime change, and B, um, the dismemberment of the Russian Federation. I think this was the wettest dream of them all, collapsing Russia, right? And among academics and similar types, it found a faint echo in all this loose talk about decolonizing Russia, right? Mm -hmm. Which was code for destroying the Russian state, frankly, right? Um, so Russia has seen this. Let's assume within five years, Europe behaves more normally again. Europe is a little mm -hmm. more reasonable again, chastened by its experiences. Russia will still, because they're not fools, look at Europe and say, we don't know where they are in 20 years. Right. So we will build a good relationship with them, but we are also not trying to build them up or favor them or. And again, when Alexander brought up, Russia will, I think, be much more interested, of course, in its actual partners, China, to an extent, India, other partners are not quite as big, but they're important and potentially the United States, if there is another age of detente. So Europe, no, they're not going to get like a comfortable deal with Russia, but they might get a deal. They might yeah. get a deal. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree with that. Tariq, Cyril, Ahmad, thank you for joining us on this live stream. This was a, this was a great show. And I will have your information as a pinned comment down below, your Twitter, your Substack, as well as your website. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Tariq. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. All right, Alexander, we have a few questions to, mm -hmm. to get to, and we'll mm -hmm. wrap up this, this live stream. Let's see. Kyle, thank you for that super sticker. Um, Amir says, is, is she a man? Talking about uh, Macron, the whole Candace Owens. Macron <laughs> issue. Yeah. Pass. <laughs> I pass um, on that one. A lot of people talking about it. Uh, Elena says, uh, 34 trillion in debt. How can the USA get out of that without a total war? At least get rid well, of, of European competition of the euro. Well, it's it's going to get harder and harder with every single month and year that this thing goes on for. The first rule when you're in this kind of hole is to stop digging to start rethinking what your economic policies are. The United States still has huge resources, still an immensely rich country. It has it, a lot of potential to turn this thing round. It will be challenging to do, but it can be done. And war absolutely is not the right way to do it. That would be a catastrophe. It would make the situation um, existentially worse. So they do have time and space to sort it out, but they are running out of time and they're running out of space. And an awful lot is going to depend on what, on the coming election. Just saying. Yeah. Ricardo, thank you for that super sticker. Sparky says free Assange. Mm -hmm. Tim Gibson, thank you for that super sticker. Sparky says, does it somehow seem foolish for the West to play Russian roulette against its namesake? Yes. <laughs> I, I would really advise people to read Alex Fashinin's piece on Rusi, it is it is incredibly insightful. It is brilliant, actually. What, what is the um, website that it's on again? It's, it's, it's on Rusi, Royal United Service Institute. It's surprising that they allowed him to publish something like that there. But the absolute underlying message of this article is don't take on the Russians in war. That, that's, that's basically what he says, because he says, tells you how attrition war is fought and you realize that what he's actually describing is what the Russians do. All right. They're, Rusi, they're the masters of asking. this. Yeah. Rusi. Rusi, for everyone's asking. And the author is Alexander Vashinin. Ale 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 Alex Vashinin. Alex Vashinin. Alex Vashinin. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, Ricardo says Macron is less Napoleon Bonaparte and more Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> <That's true enough. laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, tired, looking for a name. What a great show. What an insightful and wise guest. Yes, yeah, Tariq was, was amazing. Yes, it was. A fantastic show. Um, where are we here? Elena says, is it just me who has a feeling many European leaders see their chance to revanche for old grudges with Russia? I read that the von der Leyen's family lost textile industries in Russia during their revolution. You're absolutely correct. Yes. <laughs> I don't know about uh, Ursula herself, but I mean, absolutely some of them have tremendous issues with Russia, complexes about Russia. And in some places, you know, I can just about understand that. I can understand why people in Poland or some people in Poland might have grievances against Russia. But, you know, you know we all spend all our time worrying about our grievances and thinking about those all the time. Then we're going to just lose sight of existing realities. And that is exactly what we have done. And again, to understand the existing realities, go, I say this once again, go to what Alex Vashinin has been writing. All right. Sparky says, I noticed that in the waning days of the Cold War, through reunification, Germans were becoming more and more domesticated, followed by the U.S. millennial generation being domesticated from birth. I think that's true. I mean, I, I, I know Germany quite well. I travel to Germany often. My wife as I've said many times, it's half German. And um, it was a very, very civilian place. I mean, you know, the, there was actually a, a positive aversion to military things in Germany at one point in time. And it's very strange to me how all that's changed. But um, to completely change it entirely so that you go back to the... Germany that existed before the First World War, with you know, with everybody in the army and bands and soldiers and all that sort of thing, that would require a social revolution, which is beyond, I think, what even today's Germany can achieve. Sparky says, "Build a better world with bricks." Yeah. Sparky says, "De Nazify Israel." Mm -hmm. William says, "Putin and Putinism has been entrenched by the West, by Putinism. I mean, after Putin has gone." Russia will be governed by Russians for Russians. Yes, I agree with this. <laughs> this is exactly what's happened. I mean, we have, the West has engineered a massive consolidation of Russian society. Mm -hmm. and, and that is what, that, that's what all this pressure, all the regime change attempts, the economic sanctions, the proxy wars, that's what it's actually done. Consolidation of Russian society in a way that is, to put it mildly, skeptical of the West and what it promises now. Sparky says, every time, there's a quote, every time anyone says that Israel is our only friend in the Middle East, I can't help but think that before Israel, we had no enemies in the Middle East. U.S. missionary John Sheehan. It's true. It's absolutely true. Uh, Log 66 says, uh, Cypriot government is a non-representative and supine entity to the UK, just as the UK is to the US. Any prospect of change in this unpopular Cypriot government? I can't, well, I can defer that to Alex, who is, uh, uh, who is from Cyprus. I don't think there's any change. Well, I don't think no. there's any change in Greece or any of these places. Greece I think it's wrong. wrong to single out Cyprus, if I have to Mi say. Mi I, Mitsotakis I, I, is just sending a ton of weapons to Ukraine no, via there's... the Czech Republic. There's, there's, no, there's no change. No, yeah. absolutely not. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, Sparky says, Putin, Putin may trust Trump, but should wait and be wary of anyone Trump hires until he sees that the deep state is truly stifled. This may never happen. Putin went out of his way in his, in his recent interview with Kiselyov to say that he didn't trust anybody. And he actually mentioned that he'd actually had uh, uh, um, issues with Trump himself and that Trump at one point even accused him of wanting uh, Biden to win <laughs> instead of himself, in, 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 a, in a presumably a telephone exchange, which Putin said was simply not true, by the way. But, you know, I, I don't think Putin is waiting for Trump. Yeah. Uh, Tatiana, thank you for that super sticker. Uh, Sparky says, go Yemen, fight the power. Mm -hmm. uh, Stana, 
Thank you for that uh, super sticker. Um, Anas Bele Chabab says, certain social clubs who borrow their name from construction have excessive influence in EU and UK. They have been targeting Russia since the 1700s. Well, maybe. Yeah. Um, Life of Brian says, the oligarch sacrificed Macron as a trial balloon in the last throw of aggressive escalation, figuring he was finished politically regardless. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting take. Uh, Russell Hall says, we're all drunk with sex wine from a dirty cup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, G G1416 says, how do policymakers inform themselves? Do they form their opinions just by reading the mainstream media, think tanks? What about executive leaders? They mainly form their opinions from reading what they read, from reading the media. Um, that was my experience. Uh, when I was on the fringes of politics um, before, and I've spoken to people who are involved in politics now, and they tell me that nothing has changed. That That's the reality of it. They do get briefings sometimes in the intelligence agencies, but what the intelligence agencies say is very little different from what the media also says. I'm just saying. Uh, from Odyssey, from Breaking Bread, how's the socialism working out? And from... Um, locals from Jeff Rock, I'll be watching the recording for the stream, but if not discussed, how do you all see Trump's end the Gaza war quickly comment? Well, I hope he, find, I hope he does have a diplomatic uh, uh, um, solution. I don't know what it is. Always with Trump, one has to wait and see. I, I think he can end the Ukraine war very quickly, actually. Whether he can end the Gaza conflict, I don't know, because... I mean, he might be conflicted there. He has very, very strong feelings towards Israel. His son-in-law uh, um, is obviously um, a Jewish community person who has also very strong commitments to Israel. I remember seeing um, photographs of Trump's office. Um, whether that means that he's got more leverage over Israel, and it would have to be, he would have to use leverage with Israel in order to end the Gaza war fast. We'll just have to wait and see. It really depends very much on him. Uh, Rob One asks, Australia's top two spy chiefs were booted from the Intelligence Committee and must now be invited going forward. I hope this is an effort to distance our politicians from the U.S. intel influence. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't bank on it. <laughs> wonder whether they'll just be giving some advice that people just don't want to hear or who knows. I mean, I don't know enough about the story to comment, but I don't suspect, I don't suspect nothing's going to change. Yeah. Zahir, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Rebel King says, as a student of Islamic eschatology, the Gaza and Israel war was predicted by our scholars and prophesized. It will end with World War Three. Iran, Israel, Iran, Iran, Israel, Iran, Israel, with will de with declare officially. Will declare well, officially. I hope not. I mean, if you don't mind my saying so, I hope you're wrong because I mean, World War Three is a horrific thought, and I hope we can find a way out. Uh, Lana, thank you for that super sticker. Rebel King says, if you look like uh, not NAZI ideology and the way the NAZI youth were taught, it is the exact same thing as the IDF and the Israeli. Well, uh, I, I don't know enough about these things. All I will say is what's going on in Gaza is terrible and needs to stop and needs to stop fast. And it is doing massive damage to the United States and to the collective West and to Israel itself. Raphael and not, not to mention what it's doing to the Palestinians, which is beyond appalling. Raphael says, guys, put this into proper uh, co context for us. What did Putin want to say here? Quote, America, you are not ready for a nuclear war. Wow. Drop the mic. <laughs> this, I think, comes again from Kiselyov, uh, uh, the, the article with Kiselyov. What, what, what he was basically saying, the point he, he made it very clear in, during the program. Look, for us in Russia... Ukraine is a life or death matter. If Ukraine were to win and, you know, the, 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 the regime that exists there were to survive and it were to become incorporated in NATO, 
it would be an existential, a mortal danger to Russia itself. So the Russians have to win. The same is not true for the West. It is not for them a life or death matter. And given that that, given that, that is so, whilst the Russians in a life or death situation have the motivation to escalate to the very furthest point, the United States doesn't. And that's what he means by the fact that they're not ready for nuclear war. JM says, have you watched The Greatest Story Never Told? I've always felt parts of history are being censored. I've never watched, just saw it mentioned. Do you know something? I never have. <laughs> I've heard a lot about this film, but I've never watched it. So I shouldn't be commenting about it before I do. Strange, because I'm something of a film buff, by the way. Rebel King says, will determined people remove Adolf Scholes? Will they? Perhaps there's lots of rumors about this, but the story at the moment is that the man who will take over will be Boris Pistorius, who's in full hard line and extreme as Scholz has been. So um, I, I wouldn't, you know, be careful what you wish for. At least that's what I would say. Elza says, sad thing about German academics is that most didn't notice the shift in the media. My experience that most of them don't question the narrative. It's the same true in Britain, exactly the same true in Britain, uh, to a degree that I find incredible. You know, I can actually, in Britain, I can actually put a particular finger point on when it happened, which was the autumn of 1999. Um, that was when um, there was the war. The first there'd be the war in Yugoslavia, which The Guardian and all of those supported. And then Putin was appointed prime minister. And within weeks, about, about two weeks of Putin being appointed, The Guardian was publishing an editorial demanding that Putin, that Yeltsin sack him. No Nobis says, 70 years, Queen never visited Israel. Intentional? Question mark. I don't know. Um, I think yes, actually. I, I, I think that um, for all kinds of reasons, um, the British authorities wouldn't have wanted her to go and she probably didn't want to go herself. But you know, she's, she's, she's passed away and she's not going to tell us. Maybe her diary will, when it's eventually published in 50 years' time, will provide us with more insight. Rebel King says, sadly, the dream of Western democracy only makes sense when you're sleeping. Uh, Jerry says, AC and AM, how many languages do you each speak? Well, I speak English and Greek. Um, I used to speak French quite well, but I've lost nearly all of it. If I were to spend time in France, a couple of weeks in France, it would probably come back. And that's it, actually. Um, I, I used to, again, um, I'll, you know, for school, for some time afterwards, I used to speak quite a lot of Latin, and that's it. English, Greek, Spanish, and I'm trying Russian. Russian. Conversational in Russian, but I need I need help. I need to, you need to speak it. To learn a language, you need yeah. to speak it. So yes. you need practice, and I don't get much practice. Uh, Life of Brian says, if the choices for PM of England were Macron, Trudeau, or Mussolini, Alexander, who? Interesting <laughs> oh, yeah. What, 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 what a question! I mean, really, what? A, I mean, oh, God help us! I mean, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to give a pass on that one. I mean, it's a. It's a I, I have to ask you this question, Alexander. What, what is Obama doing meeting with Sunak? What a very, very good question. Is he telling him to step aside, perhaps? I don't, I don't know. I'm asking. I'm, no, I mean, I don't what, know. I don't know. I mean, it, people here. If about you had to take people, a guess. People if you had to take a guess, just a, you know, what would you say it's about? What would I say it's about? I, I, I can't believe it's about. I have, no, I have no clue. I can't believe it's about British politics. Why would Obama be interested in British politics? He may be saying to um, Sunak, look, we've got to do everything we possibly can to stop the orange man getting back and becoming president again. And can you find some means?
using your very effective intelligence agencies mm -hmm. and your information and your contacts in the United States to help us achieve that. I, I, I have to say that seems to be far and away the most plausible explanation, but it is a guess. Mm -hmm. Sophisticated Caveman says, if the Turks pivot to Russia, does that open the door to the rest of Southeast Europe following? Is that actually possible? Well, it isn't going to happen immediately. Um, it's the, the Turkey has got much closer to Russia than I would ever have imagined. What I don't know is how permanent this is. We'll just have to wait and see what happens once Erdogan does leave the scene. But people who know more about Turkey than me, a lot more about Turkey than me, tell me that there has been a shift in Turkish society and even in the political system and that they are thinking in a more, shall we say, Eurasianist way. But I, I, you know, I don't pretend I'm an expert on Turkish politics. Uh, breaking Bread says the best geopolitical team, the Duran. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that Breaking Bread. And Rebel King says, can you explain how Western journalists still have the audacity to question Russian elections when ours are a complete sham? Well, I, I, you know, I agree with the sentiment you've just expressed. I'm not going to comment further on that. I mean, this is a... I mean, what they've been saying about these Russian elections is just ludicrous. And the descent into absurdity was saying that, you know, queues of people lining up to vote is a sign of protesting against the election. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I find that is one of the craziest and most nonsensical and most silly pieces of misinformation I've ever, I've ever encountered. I mean, it takes real foolishness to come up with something like that. Just call me Ann and says, thank you, Alex and Alexander, for your hard work. Mm. Thank you for that. St. Max says, Alex and Alexander, what stance do you think the U.S. should take towards NATO that would actually help the European nations? Oh, I think the United States should simply wind up the whole mess and walk away. I think that would be best for the Europeans and best for the United States. That's my own personal view. You do a deal, obviously, with the Russians on security. But, I mean, NATO has become a real nuisance and a real danger. And as I said, wind it down. I mean, all it's do, all it's done, all that expanding NATO eastwards has done is that it's involved the United States in a conflict in Ukraine, which is of no, in, no use. Ukraine is of no use to American security. It doesn't add anything to American security. Of course, if you're pursuing neocon geopolitical imperial projects then you can see how it can can make a, some kind of sense but those projects are not founded in reality so i mean you know just ditch the, the whole thing walk away focus on american interests and do a proper deal with russians and forget nato and bury this uh, um this undead creation left over from the cold war once and for all Alva Motion says, Alva Motion says, Putin is winning three to zero against Zelensky. I have three books on Putin and zero on Zelensky. <laughs> True enough. Hit game of chairs. Thank you for that. Super chat. Uh, Prak 2 says, if the Nazis and the fascists are left, are the left, not the right. The right is about limited government and the American constitution is based on that. Well, uh, um, you, you're applying an American conception. I, I mean, I, I don't actually agree with this. I think there was in Europe a social democratic left, which was completely different from what you're describing. And I don't personally agree with you that the fascists uh, and the Nazis were in any in any sense a left wing movement. The Nazis came up with some left wing slogans from time to time. But I don't personally take them particularly seriously. I, I don't want to get into a long, deep discussion of this issue, which is uh, one really for academic scholarship. Elza says, about marriage, he should consult Macron. Joke. <laughs> for that, uh, Tabernak says, sea patrols in the Gulf of Oman? Question mark? It was indeed, yeah. Oh, wait, Rus Russian, sorry. Russian, I see the flags. Russia, China. Iran sea patrols in the Gulf. Yeah, absolutely. Oman. They've they've just they've just conducted naval exercises there. It, they're, they're not uh, new. I mean, they've conducted exercises like this before. 
But obviously, these exercises are getting bigger all the time and they're becoming more politically relevant now. Sophisticated Caveman asks, how will Russia secure Kaliningrad long term? All neighbors to the enclave are pathologically hostile. This seems very dangerous. Well, it could become extremely dangerous. But again, I suspect that it ultimately depends on what the West does. If all this talk of trying to turn the Baltic Sea into a NATO lake, which is nonsense, by the way, makes absolutely no sense. People who talk in this way have no understanding of the real military capabilities of Sweden and Finland and the real uh, potential for the United States to project power in this region. And the Russians are overwhelmingly strong in the Baltic. But oh no, if, if NATO does something really stupid with respect to Kaliningrad, well, then, of course, I mean, you know, we're getting into World War Three type situations. And if we avoid the ultimate consequences of those, then the entire geography, the political geography of the Baltics will be changed forever. All right. And one last uh, question from Jam. Blinken is in the Philippines. Is Taiwan next? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Very likely. Very likely he is going to Taiwan. All right. Uh, that is everything, Alexander. Let me do a final check. Uh, your your final thoughts. Oh, I thought it was an absolutely outstanding check. live stream. Brilliant questions. And a absolutely superb and outstanding guest. And a very enjoyable live stream, if I may say. It was always interesting to talk and to, uh, to read, read uh, Tariq Cyril Armas. Um, work is always enlightening and i hope we have him many times again we, we have one more question and we're going to wrap it up yeah. with this question alexander yeah. from tabernak and this this is tabernak this is a, a very important question actually mm. advice on picking the right woman to marry alexander oh. mccurse <laughs> wait and she will come that's my advice uh, um you know i had various encounters in my time some of them very happy and very enjoyable but um when the person who i knew i was going to marry finally came i married her and there was absolutely no doubt about it at all and we had a very heavy ma marriage ever since all when right. it when, when, when she appears you will know thank you tabernak for that uh, final uh, super chat that final question an important one all right uh we will end it there Thank you once again to uh, Tariq for uh, an amazing uh, live stream. Thank you, Alexander McGurris. Thank you to everyone that joined us on Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, vdurant.locals.com, YouTube. And uh, thank you to our moderators, to Spartan Warrior Queen, to Peter, to Zariel. And uh, who else? Who else? I hope I'm not missing anybody here. I think that's that's everybody. All right, uh, reckless abandon, reckless abandon. I don't want to miss reckless abandon. Thank you very much. All right, let's uh, end it there. Take care, everyone. Absolutely. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you again.